Hello, my name is Wes, and I'm the Outreach Director here at Vertical Life Church. Thank you so much for checking out our channel. I hope that you are awakened and empowered to follow Jesus after this week's sermon. Check it out. Good morning. How are you? Doing well? You guys look awesome, if I could see you. But uh, anyways, I am so glad to be with you guys here this morning. Can you believe it is December? That is insane. How many people your Christmas shopping is done? Raise your hand. How many people? Have, I mean, whoa, no, barely no one. Wow. And the two people are two women. So uh, they're on top of it. Probably moms as well. Anyways, how many people you haven't even started? That's me. All right. How many people you started, but you got a lot to do? All right. We're, how many people you have a list? You know what you're going to buy. How many people you have no clue what you're going to buy? Yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm right there with you. I have a little list started on my notes app in my phone, and um, so I'm somewhere. But I'll tell you one thing. I do love Amazon Prime. It comes very quickly within two days. And so unless there's some kind of storm and everything gets delayed, I can shop very quickly with Amazon Prime. And, uh, and everything anymore provides free shipping, it seems like. So I think, I think I'm good to go. But guys, I am so excited to uh, start this new series. As Wes mentioned earlier, it's called Field Guide. And basically what it's about is we're, you know, there's just topics that we face in life that we're really not sure how to deal with. with. And some of those topics kind of come up a little bit more around the holidays. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to address specific topics in this series and help you kind of navigate the terrain of life and to overcome the obstacles that kind of present itself to us. And like I said, the reason we're doing it right now, uh, right before the holidays, is because I do believe there's certain things that kind of we're faced with more during the holidays and other times of the year, and especially today's topic. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, today's topic is a little bit more somber, and so we're just kind of slow down and, and discuss something. But it's something that I think it's important for us to address, even though in some ways it's been some form of a taboo in the church culture. But this topic, it impacts people of all walks of life. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your age. It, It doesn't care about your social status or anything about those types of things. It impacts so many people. In fact, the World Health Organization said that over 300 million people, and that's what's been discovered, are impacted by this, and that's depression. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not an expert on this. Like, I've watched some messages over and over and over again. I've did a little bit of, re- just a little bit of, uh, um, like, reading statistics and so forth. And it's, it's overwhelming what's going on when it comes to depression. Do you know that one in nine people right now are on some form of antidepressant? In fact, one in five people have been at one point or another on some form of antidepressant. And, and it is the number one, this is crazy, it is the number one reason for disability between the ages, now get this, 15 to 44, the number one reason for disability. And the production of antidepressants has, has increased by over 300%. That's insane. And you might say, Jeremy, I, I don't know why you're really talking about this, and, and that's exactly why I'm talking about it. Because I think we have to be intentional about creating a culture and an atmosphere where people can come forward and say, hey, I'm not doing too well. Because if we don't do that, what will happen is people will be left to try to figure out how to overcome it in their own strength, in their own ability. And instead of finding healing, what they will do is they will end up self-medicating. In some ways that people self-medicate is they do it through drugs, you know, the only reason they do is, 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 is because of drugs. And some people, they, they, med- they self-medicate through, through mind-numbing entertainment. They don't even know what they're watching. They just, they just need to, to feel something, to, to be entertained by something. And for some people, it's a promiscuous lifestyle. They don't want to sleep around, but they're, just, they're crying out for something to try to heal this, this, this feeling that they have inside. And I, actually, you know what? I want to give a, de- a definition of depression. They'll pull it up here. And it says that it's a mood disorder characterized by anhedonia. I had to look that up. I had no clue what that word was. And basically what it is, is it's your inability to have any kind of feeling or enjoyment out of things that you used to have enjoyment from. It continues on to say extreme sadness, 
poor concentration, just the inability to concentrate anymore, um, sleep problems, uh, there's a, a, a change in your appetite, you, weight loss or gain. There's a loss of energy, there's feelings of guilt, there's helplessness, and there's hopelessness. And so what people do is they try to self-medicate themselves in some way to cure these things. And unfortunately for some people, the way that they self-medicate, their answer to this is suicide. Like ending their life. And you might think, well, Jeremy, that's, that's extreme. Why would someone ever even think about that or do that? Let me tell you this, the devil is a liar. And if he whispers in your ear long enough that you have no value, that you have no worth, that you, it would be better off. In fact, your family, your friends, your workplace would be better off if you were no longer around. Eventually, what was unbelievable starts to become believable. And that's when people end their life. And it's so sad. I mean, because suicide, it's a permanent response or attempt at a temporary solution, or a, a, per, a permanent solution, forget this, let me look at it. <laughs> Suicide is a permanent attempt to solve a temporary problem. And it's irreversible. And it's sad that some people, that's what they do. In fact, I wanna put this number, this is really not my style, but I wanna put this number up here, and I want you to memorize this number for people that do struggle with this, and that's 1-800-273-TALK. Because there's people around you right now that might be facing this, this ugly thing called depression. And, and, he, and you have no clue how far they're away from maybe even taking their own life. In fact, the stats on suicide is, is mind-boggling. Do you know that 40 to 47,000 people kill themselves a year? 40 to 47,000 people kill themselves a year. This is what's really insane. It is the number one killer among the ages of 15 to 24. Number one is suicide. Number one. In fact, cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, strokes, all these things are decreasing, but suicide has increased by 33%. So we're finding cures for all these other things, but, but suicide in turn is, is increasing. And I want to let you know today that no, more, no matter where you're at or what you're facing, that you ending your life is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie from the pit of hell. And I want to encourage you and let you know that there is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is freedom for you in the name of Jesus. And I pray right now, even in this moment, Holy Spirit, that if there's people in this room who are, are facing that or have thought about that or he, who have even begun to entertain the thought of ending, ending their life, we expose it in the name of Jesus and we rebuke it. And we speak freedom and we speak life over those individuals in Jesus' name. Listen, it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. When there's hope and there's freedom, and there's the, the, the options to be able to walk these things out. And I believe that you and I were never designed to walk or carry this kind of depression or, or this oppression or to live in fear and anxiety. In fact, if you look in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now, a lot of times what people, some ways that people want to interpret this is that God doesn't give you a spirit, like an entity, a demonic spirit of fear. Now, some theologians even look at this, and I tend to agree with this, that God has not designed you to, your spirit hasn't been designed to, be, uh, to, be, to walk in fear, but rather power, love, self-control, and discipline. And so you were not designed to walk in this kind of pressure and to walk in this kind of depression and all those different things. And so today what I want to do is kind of walk this out with you and, and, and look at a, a guy's life that we'll get to here in a second and kind of hopefully give you some reasons why we face depression or what kind of, um, what kind of feeds it and then some solutions for that depression. Amen. Is that okay with you guys? All right. Now, first off, I do want to say this because there's people in here you don't face depression. And for some people, it's kind of like you look at someone that is fighting depression or facing depression, and you want to say, just get over it. Well, that's like telling someone who's been shot to stop bleeding. 
You just don't stop bleeding. You know, there's, there needs to be healing brought to that area in their life. And so I encourage you, if you don't face depression, learn as much as you can today. And I pray that you never do face it. Amen? Now, there's some people in the Bible who's faced depression themselves. In fact, there's a whole book on it called Lamentations. And it's by uh, uh, the prophet Jeremiah. He wrote in, in chapter 3, verse 17 through 20, he says, My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it. And so he's saying like he's continually chewing on, on this. And as a result, his soul was bowed down within me. Even Paul, the apostle Paul himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Read, look at this verse. It's very interesting. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. This third guy I want to look at, I actually want to dive into his story a little bit more who also faced pressure and who also wanted to, to end his life. But in his life, he obviously didn't end it. And I think we can pull out some principles that we can apply to our life to, to begin to find freedom and find healing from this. And his name is Elijah. And to, to set this up, we're going to be looking at chapter 19. But in chapter 18, Elijah is this prophet, and he challenged the prophets of Baal. So basically, these are prophets of the devil. And he challenged them. There's 400 of them. And there was this argument of whose God is real and so forth. And he said, you know what? Let's do this. Let's just, let's just, let's fight this out. And this is how we're going to do it. You set up an altar. And you can call out to your gods, Baal, and see if he consumes the sacrifice. And then I'll set up an altar. And I'll cry out to God. And we'll see if he consumes the altar. And so the prophets of Baal cried out, to, cried out to their God. They're just crying out for something to happen. They have the sacrifice there. Nothing's happening. And if I remember correctly, there's one point where uh, Elijah kind of mocks it, saying, um, is your God in the bathroom right now? Where is he at? If you read the translation. So he's kind of mocking them a little bit because nothing's happening. And then Elijah, from the, after that, it's his turn. All right, guys, it's my turn. He cries out to God. And before he does this, though, he actually soaks this, the sacrifice in the altar with water, saying, I'll even up the ante. I'll even up the challenge. And so he soaks it in water. He cries out to God, and then it's all consumed. And as a result, all 400 of these men are put to death at Elijah's hand. Now, chapter, that's chapter 18. Like, I would say that guy is like, He's tenacious, like he's bold. Would you not agree? That's, that's, that's a powerful thing to do. Now in, verse, in chapter 19, there's this conversation going on behind, be, be, between Ahab and um, uh, Jezebel. And it's the king and queen. And they're having a conversation. And Ahab is filling in Jezebel, filling her in on what happened in their kingdom just in chapter 18. And this is where we're at. We're in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 4. It says, Ahab told Jezebel, so this, this is the king and queen, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger, messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she threatened him. And it was an empty threat. I mean, this guy just cried out to God who consumed the sacrifice and put to death 400 false prophets. And now here he is. He hears this empty threat and knows what his response is. In verse 3, he says, Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. That's important. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. It's from this little passage, I want to draw four things that are causes for depression in our life. And I'm not going to say that this is a complete list. I'm sure you could say I could add something to it. 
Um, but it's kind of four general areas where I, I, I almost want to call it breeding grounds, where, where depression can, can kind of grow and, and be fertilized in our life. And the first one is faulty thinking. I want you to write these things down. The first one is faulty thinking. Notice what happened. It says, he was afraid. Now, the promise or the word that, or the, the attempt that of, of Jezebel, what she said, was emp- it was an empty lie. There was nothing that she could really actually do. But it sent his life into a spiral. And if we're honest, you and I are not too different. The inner life, there's lies that been told to us that we have come to believe and slowly has changed the way we think and view at life. And an empty lie has driven your life into this downward spiral. And I believe, to be honest with you, that a lot of the dysfunction in your life and in my life, if you sat down and assessed it and traced it back to its source, it comes from some lie in your life that you've come to believe. It was some kind of empty threat. And that lie slowly became a stronghold. And that lie is where the enemy festers and causes all kinds of dysfunction and problems in your life. An empty lie can send your life into to chaos, as we can see right here with Elijah. Now, for some of you, the lie could be as something as something your parent told you when you were a child. And you believed it. Like you were not going to amount to anything, or, or you always let me down, or, or something they didn't say, or whatever. And it established this lie in your life, and it just kind of grew over time from there. And so what I encourage you to do, though, is to ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, just reveal to me any lies in my life that I've come to believe that has caused faulty thinking in my life. And for him to expose those lies in your life. Amen? In fact, let's do this. I don't want to be a church that we just sit up here and you watch me talk. Let's just practice this. Let's just say this. Holy Spirit, reveal to me any lies that I have come to believe in Jesus' name. And I pray that those lies are being exposed in your life. Things that you've come to believe that's changed your thought process and now your thinking is faulty, it's not right, it's dysfunctional, dysfunctional, it's corrupt. Look at what Philippians chapter four, verse eight through nine says, it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Like, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Like, what are you thinking about? What have you been pondering? What are you chewing on? Like, where's your soul at? Like, what's going on in here? Stop. Do an audit of what you've been thinking about. What lie have you come to believe and you're living from that lie? And take it captive, like it says in in Corinthians, that we take every thought captive that exalts itself against the name of Jesus. And we bring it to obedience to that. That if God doesn't think it about you, and you might say, well, what does he think about me? Get in the scripture. And if it's not a thought that he has about you, you cannot afford to entertain it. Cast it out. If he doesn't think it about you, then why are you thinking it about you? It says that his thoughts about you outnumber the sand on the seashores. Like his affection is set on you. Like you're you're, you're the apple of his eye. When the angels fell, when Lucifer fell, he didn't send his own son to redeem them. But when in you and I fell, he sent his son to redeem us, to restore us, to put us back in right relationship with him. If that's not the things that you're thinking about, cast it from your mind. Don't believe the lies, because if you do, just like Elijah, it causes faulty thinking. And then you'll live from it, and it births all kinds of dysfunction. The second thing, or second area that causes depression is isolation. Notice what Elijah did. That when he, faith, when he heard this lie, he told his servant to stay there. 
And he left to go process things by himself. And sometimes that is so dangerous. And I've said this before, and I'll continue to say it. Isolation scares me so bad. When I see someone slowly begin to isolate themselves, to me, that's a warning sign. A red flag goes up. I mean, it's one thing to set set aside some time to seek the Lord. But it's completely different when you begin to close off the avenues that God has placed in your life to speak life and truth to you, like Christ-centered relationships or the church. I mean, some of you, you this, this Sunday service is the only time you hear any life spoken over you. So you need to be here all the time. But you need to grow from that and include community groups and relationships. You cannot isolate yourself. Like what? One guy said, he said that isolation isn't, I mean, a friendship isn't a privilege, it's a necessity. Like, you need friends in your life. And what's crazy is that you can be with people and still be alone. That not being isolated is more than just being with someone, it's being known by someone. That's a big difference. You should write that down. It's not... There is, it's more than being with someone. It's being known by someone. That's, that, is there someone that knows you and knows your secrets? Is there someone that knows you and knows your secrets? Don't isolate yourself. I think it's demonic. And what do you mean, Jeremy, demonic? What are you talking about now? I'm talking about I believe that in isolation is where the devil does his best work. He gets you off. Don't you guys watch the Discovery Channel? And the poor little, poor little, not llama, what's out there? Antelope or? Yeah. <laughs> See a llama, he's just running around. Poor little antelopes get separated or the wounded one, they get separated and what happens? It's not good, is it? Unless you're the lion, but it's not good. So when I see isolation happen, it scares me. And some of you guys, you're here on Sunday morning and I, and, and I, 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 I applaud you for that. I think it's fantastic, but you're still alone. Because someone doesn't know you. Some of you, you got people around you all the time. Like you're the life of the party. But you're still isolated because someone doesn't know you. You're not known. Find someone that you can trust to, 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 to hear what's going on in your life. You cannot afford to allow the devil's lies and his voice to go uncountered in your life. And when you isolate yourself, that's what happens. The devil whispers, and you don't have a friend or someone in your life to counter them and say, hey, that's not true. Don't believe that about yourself. Some of you might be like, I'm just a failure. I'm worthless. I always drop the ball. You need a friend in your life to say, that's not true. Don't believe those lies. Do not isolate yourself. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toll. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Don't do life alone. Find someone. And listen, Andrew did a wonderful message a couple weeks ago about confession, how confession is a weapon. Something happens when you get with someone and confess and and share what's going on in your life. And don't allow shame to stop you from those things. I get it. There's things that you just don't want to tell anyone, but don't allow shame to live in your, to, to, to rule in your life. In fact, I love what this one guy says. He says, we would rather avoid shame than chase victory. Just drop the mic. I would, but I'm afraid I'll break it. We would rather avoid shame than chase victory. Don't do life alone. And I get it because I'm, I'm a very emotionally independent person. Like, I cry up here. You're you guys might think, what do you mean, Jeremy? You're crying all the time. I'm very emotionally independent. I'm one of those out of sight, out of mind people. Me and my wife, we've celebrate, we're getting ready to celebrate 12 years of marriage, and it took me probably five to thank you. It took me about five to realize that I need to call and let her know where I'm at and what's going on. 
I'm just an independent person emotionally, but I cannot do life alone. We need someone that knows us. The third thing is being led by feelings. Notice that what Elijah did, that when he, when he was afraid, that feeling, that emotion drove his life. It says that he arose and ran for his life. So Elijah allowed his feelings get to, get to get the best of him. And some of us, if we are honest, we do the same thing. We allow our emotions and our feelings to get the best of us. Listen, feelings and emotions are wonderful servants. They make horrible masters. And what do I mean by that? When you allow emotions and what you feel to direct your life, you will end up in a cesspool of a mess. And some of us, unfortunately, emotions and feelings drive your life, not truth or the word of God. And when you, feel, when you have a feeling or emotion, you need to counter it with the word of God. Amen? Do not allow emotions, do not allow those things to drive you. Now listen, I'm not saying emotions aren't real. They are very real and they're strong, but they're not truth. Amen? You guys doing okay? They're just not truth. And we live in a society and a culture today where the world just tells us, do whatever you feel. That's a lie. That's a poor, poor, poor advice. Do not do what you feel. Get yourself in the word of God. Hide his word deep in your heart. Live your life from that as being the foundation for your life. Amen. John 8, 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The fourth thing that's a breeding ground or a cause for depression is comparison. Notice what Elijah said at the end of his um, his little sentence there. He says, for I am no better than my father's. Comparison can ruin your life. And, And we live in a time and age where social media, like it's awesome, I love it. But at the same time, it's, sometimes it just seems horrible. Like you see all the updates people are doing in their homes and then you look at your home and realize you don't have the money. Or you see this wonderful life where the kid's laughing and he's, he's just like perfect and he's always clean and always giggling. And, and your kid, you look at your kids and you're like, who are you? Like, <laughs> there's no way you're from me. You're like the spawn of Satan. Where did you come from? <laughs> and then what happens is you just compare yourself to this world that's, fictitious in some ways because they post it's like a highlight reel of someone's life and what you do if you're not careful you'll watch those things and you'll compare your life oh that person got a new car well ain't that nice the next thing you know it puts your heart in turmoil and remember these are areas where depression can grow from and comparison can do that so quickly well, look at them. They got the new iPhone 10 Max X Plus or whatever it is. I still got the iPhone 2. Or you're coming in with the, the, the bag phone, you know, with the... <laughs> go out for coffee, you set your bag phone on the, on the table. Do you guys even remember that? No, someone said no. Okay. <laughs> but comparison can be just, it can be deadly. And we need to learn to live, and this is something I have to tell myself all the time, is to live for the audience of one, and that's him. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul's writing, he says, for, I'm now, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And he's talking about the gospel and different things here, but he's saying that the driving factor of his life is that I'm living for the audience of one. That's him. And that's you and I. We need to learn to live for an audience of one. Now, I want to read a little bit more of Elijah's story to kind of give us a pathway or some, or some principles or habits that we can apply to our life to walk and find freedom. But before I do that, I want to tell you something. I want to pause for a second and let you know and remind you again that there's healing and freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen? That's, you need to give me a better amen. Amen? amen. There is freedom and there's healing in the name of Jesus. And in John 10, 10, it says the enemy has come, the thief has come to only do, to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus is saying, to give life and life abundantly. That word for life there is zoe, which means physically, spiritually, emotionally. So he wants all of you to be whole and healed. 
That's God's desire for you. And you need to realize that there's freedom and he's already paid the price for you to be free. And you can walk in that freedom. And there's certain things that we can do to, to walk in that freedom. And that's what I want to encourage you with here as we close out, as we read Elijah's story. I'm going to continue on in chapter, or 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 5 through 8. It says, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. And he ate and drank and laid down again. Notice what's going on here. Like, his soul is crazy. He's, he wanted to end his life. He takes a nap. An angel wakes him up, says, hey, eat. And what does he do again? He takes a nap. And let's continue on. It says in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food Forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And it continues on where, where God shows up in different ways, but he's, seen in the, in, he's heard in a still, small voice. And so he encounters the presence of God. And then God gives him new directives. He gives him a new purpose. He says, hey, I want you to go anoint these certain individuals. And then I also want you to go find Elisha. Not Elijah, Elisha, Elisha. I want you to go find him and pour yourself into him. And so here, I encourage you to go ahead and read the rest of the story, but here I think there's a few things that we can learn and be able to apply to our life when we're facing extreme pressure or depression. And the first thing is physically, like getting healthy physically. Notice what, the, what, the, what he did here. He, he slept, he got up, he ate, he slept, he got up, he ate. That's what he did there. And a lot of times we want to blame our our. our, our, our troubles in our life on spiritual matters all the time. I'm not saying that some of these things aren't spiritual because I definitely believe in demonic warfare and all those different things, but sometimes it's just a physical thing. Like you're, you're running yourself ragged. Like there's no margin in your life. You have no margin in your finances. You have no margin in your time. You have no margin in your relationships and it leads to no margin in your soul. And that's a bad and horrible place to be. And listen, I'm right there with you. Like, I am horrible at trying to take a Sabbath or a rest. I'm horrible at it. But the first thing that some of us need to do and realize is to overcome and to fight depression is just to do an audit on our life and realize how out of balance we really are. Some of you need to go take a nap. Everybody says amen. Some of you need to take a day and not do anything besides just rest. Some of you need to look at what you're eating. Like, we're not made to live this fast food lifestyle. Look at your diet. Just look at what your entertainment is. There's just some practical things that you and I can do to, to walk and be healthy. It's not all just spiritual. Now, listen, I do believe there's a spiritual side to this. And you've been given authority over that in the name of Jesus. But you can't sit here rebuking the devil for lung cancer and continue smoking your cigarettes. There's some things that you got to do in your own life to, to bring some, some uh, to, kind of like your life into a rhythm, to a healthy rhythm. Practical things. You know, me and my buddy, Chris, uh, we were talking on the phone the other day and we were talking about how everyone is just like hustling all the time. You know, you see hashtag hustle and there's these podcasts that talk about how you can hustle more and and there's these YouTube channels and all these different things and people are getting side jobs and all this different stuff and and it's kind of like Chris and I were talking but at what cost like your kids are, your kids are growing up so you can chase some American dream or compare yourself to Joneses you stress yourself out, out decisions and things that you purchase and buy so you can compete with the Joneses or the neighbors. And then you got to get a side job to hustle and you wonder why you're depressed, depressed and under pressure. You got to create some margin in your life. At what cost are you and I chasing these things? Because one moment you'll be over here doing your high side hustle and next moment you'll turn over and your, your kid's a teenager. At 
happens like that. Listen, I heard a pastor say this one time, and I thought it was fantastic. He said, you're always cheating on something. Just be intentional about what you're cheating on. In the sense of you're always going to either cheat on, your, on the American dream, your family, work, relationships, whatever. Just be intentional about where you're spending your time. And some people in this room, you need to do an audit on your life and assess your life and where you're spending your time and make some difficult decisions to create healthy margin in your life. Amen? So the first thing is just get healthy physically. Psalms 127.2 says, It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. He gives to his beloved sleep. The second thing is, so the first one is just your physical habits of your life. Worship team, you can make your way. The, the, the second one is spiritual habits. And basically, we need to learn to go to God and pour our heart out to him. It says in Matthew 28, verse 10, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Come to me. And that's, just, that, that's not just on a Sunday that you come into church, and, and it, but it's a habit that you make in your life, a spiritual habit, a routine of your life where you're going to him in prayer, that you're sitting with him in prayer, that you're in the word, that you're allowing him to minister to you. Man, the Holy Spirit is such an awesome counselor and friend. He's so good. And, and when, when you go and you sit with scripture and, and you can even turn on a little bit of worship music and you just sit there and you can just say, Holy Spirit, I'm told that you're my counselor. I'm told that you're my comforter. I'm told that you're my friend. I need you now. And just read over scripture and pray the scripture over your life. If you're fighting anxiety, if you're fighting depression, find passages and just read them over your life and pray them over your life. If you're, if you're, you're fighting about your identity, whether you're loved or not, find those scriptures where God just loves you and just read them over your life. Spend time in his presence. You know, it says in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He says, in your presence. I heard a guy talking about it, and I thought it was a very interesting point. We think his presence is something that we just need to go to a place and wait for it. Why don't you and I learn to enter his presence, to go to him? You know, that word presence, it means face to face. Like you're, you're looking face to face. And when you're face to face with him, and you're making your heart known to him, and you're pouring out your problems to him, and you're worshiping him face to face, all those other things begin to dwindle and begin to melt kind of away. I'm not saying they're non-existent, but I'm saying that you receive a peace that passes understanding because you're learning to cast your anxieties and your fears and your, your worries on him face to face with him in his presence. Whose presence are you in? Who are you face to face with? Unfortunately, if we were honest, sometimes we're face to face with Netflix. We're face to face with college football and NFL and all these other different things are not bad. They're not bad. Hear me. It's not bad. But if you want joy in your life, if you want restoration in your life, if you want healing in your life, then you need to get face to face with him. You need to get in his presence. You need to begin to build spiritual habits in your life. You need to turn down the volume of this world and sit before him. And like it says in Psalms, it says, be still and, and know that I am God. And I get that life can be so frantic and crazy and we're driven back and forth. And there's so many things to, 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 to do and to accomplish. And there's ball games to attend and practices to take our kids to and, and, and all these different things, work and deadlines. And 
Your soul is just frantic. And you need to just build a spiritual habit of being still. And know that he is God. physical habits, spiritual habits. And the last thing I want to tell you and I want to close you with is you know, God encountered him in that moment in that still small voice. He was rested up physically. He ate and he slept. He got his mojo back. And the third thing, though, that God did is God gave him directives for his life. He gave him purpose told him, as I mentioned before, hey, go find so-and-so, anoint them, and go find Elisha and pour your heart into him. And so the third thing that you and I need in our life to help overcome and to fight depression and to prevent it in our life is to live with purpose. To live with purpose. To ask, Holy Spirit, just reveal to me you have for me. Begin to find people around you to pour your heart into, to love on them. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your friends and your neighbors. Serve here at the church. Find purpose. Notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, so my focus is not here, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So he's saying, fix your focus. What are you and I focused on? We need to have something in our life that is larger than our problems. Because some of us, your problems are your purpose. That's a horrible way to live, that your problems in your life is your purpose. That's all you talk about is your problems. That's all you Facebook about is your problems. That's all you chew on is your problems. You need to get a purpose that's greater than that. Amen? So this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand up. And we're gonna close out with this song. I know I kept you a little bit late today. But I want us right now to say, Holy Spirit, come on guys, Holy Spirit, reveal to me purpose. Holy Spirit, reveal to me purpose. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, guys, let's praise him. He's so worthy. Thank you so much for checking out this week's sermon. I hope that you're inspired to follow Jesus with your life and know him more. That's our whole purpose as a church, is that you would be awakened and empowered to take your next step in following him. For more information about Vertical Life Church, please visit verticallife.info or follow us on Instagram at verticallife.nc.